if you listen closely, you can hear the faint whisper of the siren's song. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Horror Movie Syllabus. My name is Professor Victor, and I'll be your host as we go through all the essential, noteworthy, interesting, and notorious modern horror films. If you're new to the channel, I recommend you check out the introduction video. There's a link to it in the description below, and it'll give you a pretty good overview about what the horror movie syllabus is. Essentially, we look at a particular subgenre of horror, and then we pick three movies from that subgenre to explore. And today we're going to be looking at the mermaid subgenre. And the mermaid subgenre show shows up on our horror movie supplement, which is an additional hundred subgenres to the original hundred subgenres on the horror movie syllabus. And they are admittedly a little bit more niche a little bit more specific, a little bit more myopic, if you will. Uh, and when it comes to mermaid movies, it's not a big subgenre. Mermaid movies, uh, mermaid horror movies at least, there's not a ton of them, but there's some really noteworthy ones. And not for nothing, but there's a lot of mermaid movies out there that maybe kind of toe the line of horror, or maybe don't even really qualify as horror at all. Uh, so forewarned, we're going to be looking at some movies that are light on the horror and a little heavier on the mermaid mythology stuff. And then we're even going to look at some movies where we're not really, you know, arguably not talking about a true mermaid because you get the term mermaid, you get siren, you get nymph or water nymph, and they're all kind of synonymous, but they're not actually technically the same things. I'm no expert on, you know, mythological creatures, but uh, I recognize that a mermaid and a siren and a nymph aren't necessarily exactly the same, but for purposes of this video, we're going to kind of lump it all together. We all kind of know what we're talking about. We're talking about generally uh, the the female-like creatures that live in the ocean, usually half women, half fish, tend to sing an alluring song that lure people to the ocean, maybe to their deaths, depending on what story you're telling. Uh, we, we get the idea of what we're talking about here. We're all on the same page. And I just want to make sure that's clear because... The movies that we're going to look at are, are kind of all over the map, really. We've got some serious stuff. We've got some really campy stuff. Uh, but I would say that everything that we're going to look at is, by and large, good to great, with one exception, <laughs> but we'll get to that. And, and it's worth noting that the movies are, again, light sometimes on horror and also sometimes light on mermaid. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as we go along too, but I really wanted to dig into this because I wanted to do some other creatures and and and, and maybe lesser known stuff for, for the horror movie supplement, and this fit the bill. My buddy Josh over at Movie Timelines did a, a mermaid video a while back. With, uh, it was very coincidental because I'd already had this idea to do it, but he was able to pinpoint the good and the bad of this subgenre it made my life a lot easier, uh, and, and he kind of nailed it. He might have missed one or two, but we'll, we'll get into that also. As usual, we're going to rank these movies as uh, undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate level. And in this case, we're going to do them in uh, in decreasing level of fishiness, or, or more really like an increasing order of uh, of quality. But but we'll, we'll call it decreasing order of fishiness just to keep the theme going alive. Uh, but uh, with that, let's dive into these mermaid movies and check them out. The first mermaid movie that we're looking at today, the undergraduate level selection, is She Creature. She Creature came out in 2001 and was a direct to Cinemax, direct to cable TV movie directed by legendary horror director Stuart Gordon. And it is uh, an interesting one because it's, like I said, a direct to Cinemax movie it was part of a series of movies uh, that they were doing, horror movies that they were doing. And really, this winds up being. Uh, much better than it has any business being. And there's, I think, a lot of reasons for that. And we're going to get into those in just a second. First, if you haven't seen it before, the movie stars Rufus Sewell and Carla Gugino as a pair of carnies who come across a real-life mermaid. And they decide they want to take her and try to incorporate her into, her, into their circus act because their circus act is, I don't think, a freak show act. And they think they're going to get rich on this. And in trying to transport her on a boat... The crew of the boat gets suspicious, they uncover her, and there's a lot of tension on the boat. And she is not the least dangerous thing in the world, so hijinks start to abound on this boat as, as, the, as the journey continues. And I'll stop there so as to not spoil the movie any further, but the movie 
is entertaining and it moves quickly and it's really well made. And again, a lot of this is strange because as I said, this movie was like a, a straight to Cinemax movie. They, they had this idea of doing like a, a film series based on uh, American international pictures movies from like back in the forties and fifties and stuff. Uh, and, and, and this was a, like not a remake, but using the same name as an old fifties movie named she creature and doing a, a different spin on it. The series was somewhat short lived from what I can tell. And I, mean, I actually haven't even seen the other movies on it. I've just seen this one. And I didn't realize what, uh, that this movie was part of that until I did the research for this video. And knowing that it's kind of surprising because again, like you'd think budgetarily and, and, and just quality wise, it would just be subpar, but while it's not a big budget movie by any stretch of the imagination, they sure made it look good. Now it's one location, and, you know, it's got a small cast, and and, and you know the effects are kind of you know uh, uh, kept off screen for a large chunk of the movie, and, and so that's all the kind of telltale signs of a, a restricted budget. But when it does show the stuff, the the monster, the kills, it looks good. And part of that's Stan Winston doing some of the effects on this movie, and. They look great. And part of it's Stuart Gordon. Again, I'm going to give a lot of credit to why this movie is so good, at least to me, be, uh, to Stuart Gordon, because he makes it look good. He makes it fun. He makes the movie fun. Like, you know, you, we all know Stuart Gordon's reanimator uh, and, 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 you know, from beyond, something like that. We know what we're going to get with Stuart Gordon. He's going to have some sexiness. He's going to have some gross stuff, some weird stuff, monsters, and it's going to be fun. This is happening here, too. Admittedly, takes a little while. It's kind of a subdued Gordon. And so that was one thing that the first time I watched this, because I knew it was a Stuart Gordon movie, was was a little bit of a surprise, was it really didn't feel super Gordon-y, if you will, until the end. The third act, it really took off. At that point, you're really getting classic Stuart Gordon stuff. You're getting a true monster. You're getting a fun performance. They ratchet up the sexiness a little bit. It really works. And not for nothing, there's some dark stuff in this movie going on, but it's really, for the most part, kind of a light romp. It kind of feels like it's a made-for-cable TV movie until it starts to kick in about the third act. But even when it's just kind of going through the paces in the first two acts, I'm still down with it because they've got quality actors. Rufus Sewell's a very good actor. Carlo G Gugino is fantastic. They're always bringing it. The supporting cast is good. Everybody's doing good work, and it's a compelling story. I'm enjoying the concept. The carnies taking on the the, 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 the mermaid, and the, they know the danger of the mermaid. It's good. It's, it's keeping me engaged, and then when things go off the rails, it gets really, really fun. I like this movie quite a bit, and I might be in the minority. This does not seem like a movie that gets a lot of love, a lot of praise. Even amongst Gordon's resume, this is not the one that people rave about or shine a light on. It's not even his best mermaid movie, but more, most on that later. Uh, or most popular mermaid movie. Again, we'll talk about it more in a bit. But he does good work here. And I find it to be kind of, like I said, subtler work than he normally does. I really like it. This movie, again, it's surprisingly better than it looks. If you know that it's like a made for Cinemax movie, or if you see the, the poster for it, you're going to think it's kind of cheesy. And, and I'll be honest, it is a little cheesy, but it's much better than you would think it's going to be. Much better quality of acting, much better quality of filmmaking, much better quality of effects than you're expecting it to be. And and, and just a good, a good, fun story, really good acting. The acting really brings it home. I think it really holds the story together in a way that lesser actors might not have been able to pull off. And then the effects are super cool. Like I said, that, that last act really, really, really brought it home for me. So I'm kind of higher in this movie than maybe maybe it deserves i don't know but you tell me if you've seen this movie let me know if you think that i'm being a little too effusive about it as i can sometimes be but i really like the look of the mermaid at the end i really do and even even earlier on she looks good the entire time and she's given a good performance everything about this movie just worked for me even with its limitations it just worked for me and i had a really good time with it so i'm bringing it here for you guys because i think you guys would have a good time with it as well uh and if you've seen it let me know what you think but if you haven't seen it Check it out and then come back to me and let me know. Am I right? Am I wrong? Because I, I think she could use a little bit of an underrated gem. The second movie we're talking about today, the graduate level selection, is The Lure. The Lure came out in 2015 and is a Polish musical. Uh, and it seems to be a rather well-known movie amongst horror fans, monster movie fans. Uh, this is like kind of one of the uh, the prime noteworthy mermaid movies, so it's kind of one we have to talk about here, even if it is a musical. Uh, we all know how much I love musicals, so uh, let's go ahead and dig into this one. If you haven't seen it before, the movie is a Polish film about a couple of mermaids who are found by a band that works at an adult cabaret 
and they uh, enlist the mermaids, uh, two sisters, to be in the band and sing. And they start to have their own success as singers. Uh, and, and while they're getting kind of exploited, one of them wants to be human and, and, and stay on Earth. The other one stays true to her mermaid roots. And it really is a retelling of the Hans Christian Andersen Little Mermaid tale, but much, much darker and much, much weird because uh, hijinks abound and things go real off the rails really fast uh, and it just kind of gets crazy crazy and that's really the best way i can explain this movie is that it's crazy and the musical aspect of it isn't even scratching the surface of how crazy this movie is i knew going in that this was a musical horror mermaid movie uh, that's kind of weird kind of intriguing so i'm but i'm i'm prepared for it i didn't realize when i when i first watched it that it was polish but but you pick up on that pretty quickly but what i was not prepared for is just how bug nuts crazy this movie actually is and it starts out pretty early they find the mermaids they they bring them to the cabaret owner and they show them to him and right off the bat it's just it's it's really uncomfortable because you've got these two actors who are actually i had to look it up because it was making me so uncomfortable they were in their mid-20s when they're making this movie but they look like teens they look really young and they're completely naked and we're seeing that they have no genitalia because on dry land they have legs, and then when they get wet they turn into you know the half mer you know half fish mermaid, uh, you know kind of like Splash the movie Splash, which by the way is not going to make the list today. Um, spoiler alert. Uh, but you know it's a super uncomfortable scene. I actually my wife was in the room working, and and when I was watching this movie, and she's like, "What the hell are you watching?" Like it's just so uncomfortable and weird, and 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 it just kind of goes from there in terms of just being really weird and just not going to places you think it's going to go but it does go horror places you know the mermaids eat human flesh they eat people so it goes horror and it's great and that's the thing about this movie it's super weird but i was super feeling it despite the fact that it's a musical i do i do wish it wasn't a musical like i probably would enjoy it more if it wasn't because i just I don't love musicals. I don't love when people break out into song. It's just weird to me. It doesn't really work for me. Most of the music in this musical is, you know, diegetic, if you will. It's in the world. Like they're, you know, they're they're in a band and they're singing songs at the cabaret. That stuff's fine with me. That's fine with me. But there are a couple of scenes where it turns into a full blown musical. You know, they're, they're at the supermarket or the store or whatever, and there's a whole song and dance routine in there. It's a whole production, you know, and, and it's it's a truly a bona fide musical at that point you know there's some other scenes where the you know they have like little solos that are like little soliloquies or whatever um that they're singing to the camera and uh, that's the part where it gets really musically but they're, they're not that many of them and it really didn't take me out of the movie too much and not for nothing some of the songs are actually pretty catchy they're, they're kind of cool like kind of euro trash pop music stuff which i'm kind of into they're in polish so it's not like you can really sing along super well like the you know the, the, the subtitle for the lyrics so you can kind of see some of the wit in the lyrics but not the same thing as just hearing it. So the the Polish uh, songs don't don't really translate as well, maybe. But it was it was still catchy enough. A lot of time, not all the songs work for me, but some of the songs are actually catchy enough. Musical wasn't a problem for me in this movie. It was fine. It, I wasn't loving that as musical. I wish it wasn't a musical, but I wasn't mad about it being a musical. Everything else going on is so crazy. The look of this movie is fantastic. It's a very well-made movie. I think all of the actors are giving it their all, but it's weird. It's weird. Everybody's performance is just a little bit off, and it's intentional. It's clearly intentional, but it's just off-putting. It's almost like David Lynchian in a way, but not really Lynchian in the way you think of Lynchian, but but just like these really like bizarre, over-the-top characters that are just kind of out there and don't make a whole lot of sense, and you're just kind of drawn to them anyways really really works for me uh like i just did not know where this movie was gonna go and i should have because it really is a dark telling of the little mermaid you know it really it is it, it's 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 the little mermaid but it, it's you know kind of throwing some twists on it there and there's two sisters instead of just one but the the general idea the general crux the general uh uh dilemma of the movie is the same that said these mermaids are no ariel they are not you know don't let the kids watch this one like i said a tremendous amount of nudity uh, and genitalia or lack thereof being shown. I was not prepared. I was not prepared for that. I was not prepared for uh, the the eating violence. I was not prepared for uh, the the musicality of the musical. Uh, like like just none of it. I wasn't prepared for this movie at all. Even though I knew a little bit about it going in, unprepared. Super weird. Super cool. Really well made. 
again, I can't get over the, the effects and how well they're done. And just some of the ideas, I don't want to spoil the movie too much, but some of the ideas, you know, the idea of, of, of one of the, the mermaids wanting to be a real human being is very graphically and, and uh, uh, blatantly addressed and shown in the movie. And it's super disturbing. Super weird, man. Super, super weird. And there's a perversity to this movie that I kind of love. I'll be honest with you. I kind of love it because it just goes there. The stuff that, like, you know, the weirder of us are, are thinking in our brains, they're just going to do it. They're going to go for it. They're going to put it on screen. And, and I kind of love it. I love that the movie had, it was game. It had it had the balls to do this. It had, it had the, uh, the, I don't think that an American movie does this, frankly. I, I do think that, um, or at least not a mainstream movie. Uh, uh, the fact that it's Polish, maybe, you know, the sensibility is there. They're just not as afraid to do it. I don't know. But this is a trip of a movie. I, I again, I don't want to say too many specifics. I feel like I've almost given too much away already. Uh, so I'm going to stop. I'm not saying anything other than the fact that if you haven't seen this movie, check it out, but buckle up for a really wild ride because this movie is super weird. It's not super scary. It's got some gross stuff, but I don't think it's anything that you can couldn't handle necessarily. Um, but it's it's just disturbing and weird and weird and crazy. That's like the best thing I can say about it. And it's in a great way. It's fun. Um, the music is is entertaining. Uh, definitely check this one out. Just be 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 prepared that you're not prepared is the best way I can say it. And I know a lot of you probably have seen it and, ha and have thoughts. And share those thoughts in the comments so people can get an idea of, like, you know, what they're, what they're in for. But, uh, yeah, I, I I had a feeling I'd like the lure just because his reputation was so positive, even though it was a musical. But I really liked the lure. I liked it quite a bit, despite it being a musical. So that one, this one, uh, yeah, check this one out. It, it, I, I can't say anything more because it's just, it's so weird. Check it out. It's so weird. It's so weird. In the last mermaid movie we're talking about today, the postgraduate level selection is Blew My Mind. Blew My Mind came out in 2018 and is a Swiss coming of age body horror movie uh, that is maybe a little more heavier on the drama and lighter on the body horror. Uh, but it is also a really fascinating and unsettling movie uh, in a number of different ways that Again, maybe more dramatic than horrific, but still moved me in quite a way. But we're going to get into all of that in just a minute. If you haven't seen the movie before, the movie is about a teenage girl, a Swiss teenage girl, who is uh, in a new school trying to make friends and, and trying to get in with the kind of the wrong crowd because she's got a bit of a rebellious streak in her. Her relationship with her parents is pretty strained, and she's starting to suspect that maybe... Uh, her background is not what she thought it was as her body starts to change. And it coincides with her getting her first period. So is this puberty? No, it's something definitely much more as the the toes start to get webbed and the legs start to get scales and things start to go really awkward and really wrong. And, and, and it becomes uh, very, very hard to be a teenage girl uh, when you're slowly turning into a mermaid. Uh, it will stop there so it's not spoil the movie. But you kind of already know generally speaking, where the movie's going, if you know what it's about. My curiosity would be, if you didn't know what this movie was about, how would it play? Because I think it would be much more frightening if you didn't know what was happening to her. If you just see these weird things happening to her body, would that be scary? I think it would, but early on in the movie, when something starts happening to her and her body starts having these physical changes, you know what it is. You know what's happening. You know well before she knows what's happening, what's going on. Uh, and, and I don't know if that spoils the movie or not. I don't think they were trying to hide the ball about this being a mermaid movie. I mean, looking at the posters and stuff like that. I don't think that was the case. But uh, I do think it might have played better if they if they hadn't done that. But here's the thing. Like I said before, it, it, it's not a super scary movie. And I don't think it's really trying to be all that scary. I think it is trying to be a coming-of-age drama. And I think it's succeeding like gangbusters at that. The director's name is Lisa Brulman. And uh, she's Swiss director, and I don't I don't know her work. I'm not familiar with her, but she is crushing it here. Beautifully shot film, beautifully shot, and she is getting great performances out of her actors. And the movie's got a languid, slow pace, and it's by design. It, it feeds into the the vibe of the movie, this kind of like floating through life kind of thing, uh, and then slowly ratcheting up so that by the end of the movie, it's pretty intense. But you don't realize that you got there. It's like you were suddenly like, oh, this is tense and it feels earned and normal. But I didn't realize this was being done to me. I, I you know, I thought it was just kind of floating along this drama. And then I realized, oh, this is actually getting kind of tense. Great. Great job directing. The acting is wonderful. Every single person in here is 
doing a really great job. Coming of age movies can be difficult, especially when the actors playing, the, the characters are usually a little older than the characters they're playing, which I think is the case here. I hope it's the case here. And, 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 and you know, these, 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 these themes that are being talked about, you know, this idea of, of like sexual awakening and puberty and getting your period and all these, you know, kind of being tied to, into this allegory, this mermaid allegory and all of it being kind of tied together very overtly, uh, is, is really great. It, it reminded me in some ways of Ginger Snaps, only kind of done better, if I'm being honest with you, a little more artistically. This has a very art house feel to it in, in a good way. And it's, you know, it's dealing with some really dark stuff, not just this coming of age, you know, uh, female awakening stuff, but some really dark stuff because the, you know, sex is a big theme in this movie uh, and virginity and stuff like that. And the girl is playing a 15 year old girl and from context, I know nothing about Swiss law, but from context, I'm getting the impression that 16 rather than 18 is the age of consent there. Uh, 18 being the age of consent here in America. I think it's 16 based on what the movie was telling me. But even then, she's 15 in the movie, and that, that gets brought up in the movie. And, and it's worth noting because there's some, you know, some stuff that's, again, it's getting brought up in the movie of her being sexually involved with, uh, with men and, and, and older men. Uh, and and you know where there's this underage sex going on it, it's it's uncomfortable you know there's some talk about like suicide and drug use and and self-harm uh, a lot of really dark really heavy stuff that really feels very real very you know modern teen issues or you know, modern but we, we have a, a spotlight on that now and so this movie is hitting hard in those areas and, they, and when i said there's some really disturbing stuff in this movie that's really the stuff i'm talking about the the body horror stuff there's some pretty gross stuff in here like there's some pretty gross stuff there's some really good effects really good makeup jobs but that's not really where the horror is the body horror feels a little light i'm not gonna lie it's this um this is dark stuff this dark the, the underage sex stuff the drug stuff the suicide stuff the harm stuff self-harm stuff it's it's all it's pretty dark i don't think i think it's super duper heavy but if you're sensitive to this stuff it's going to probably be a pass for you, honestly. Um, but uh, there's a scene at the end that really is very upsetting uh, uh, in terms of like she's drunk and there's like a bunch of boys that are trying to take advantage of her. And it just, it go it, 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 it mercifully kind of gets stopped before it gets too, too, too much. But it's, it's that kind of stuff that just really threw me for a loop. But it was, I was so engaged in this movie. I was so connected to the main character. And not for nothing, but the other character, the girl playing her best friend, who you know is you know, starts off as the typical typical mean girl, and then it it goes on, and she develops, and and the relationship develops, and this movie dealing with a lot of things, like not, not not for nothing, just not just sexual awakening, but like uh, sexual orientation, and kind of trying to figure out who you are as a person, and for her, it's quite literally who is she, or more importantly, what is she, and it really nails that, it really works out really really well, uh, and I love that, and while the movie didn't end exactly the way that I wanted it to or that I thought it would it did end really really well I thought that they nailed this from start to finish I have zero complaints about this movie it really is fantastic and I was surprised because this is one I don't hear people talk about as much and maybe because it's not really super horror but I do think it's a must see like if you like mermaid stuff if you like coming of age stuff if you like uh just really well-made art fast films type, type stuff this is this is great stuff it's really really good so i'm recommending it checking out if any of you have uh, seen it let us know what you think in the comments of course but i'm guessing a lot of you probably haven't seen it but i would employ you to check it out because um it's astoundingly a really really well-made movie and i really liked it so that's going to do it for our exploration of mermaid horror movies but of course i've got some extra credit movies to talk about because there's still a lot of fun to be had the first extra credit movie I'm going to mention is Killer Mermaid. Killer Mermaid came out in 2014 and is also known as Nymph and is also known as Mamula because that is the Serbian name for it. Uh, and it was a Serbian movie, uh, even though it's filmed, it's, it's in English, uh, but it is made uh, you know, by Serbians and most of the actors are Serbian or or Eastern European. Uh, and, and it is uh, a kind of a guilty pleasure movie for me more than anything. It's not so much that it's good so much as I just... I just enjoy it, but we're going to get into all that. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, the movie is about a pair of American girls, or at least we're supposed to believe they're American girls, that are on vacation, and they run into an old college friend who recommends taking them to this old uh, military facility uh, off on this deserted island, and 
They go there, but there is a mysterious man there who has been killing people the entire time. Uh, and, and he has got uh, a mermaid trapped in a well there. Uh, and they are investigating and hijinks start to abound. And we're going to stop there so as to not spoil the movie anything uh, anymore. But this is not a great movie. I just start out right up front. It's not that it's a great movie. It's not even particularly a very, very good. But I had fun with it. Uh, and, and I think the fun might be unique to me uh, because I I just enjoyed the elements that were happening in this movie. Like, you have to understand, this movie is, it's got basically two minds. One is to try to tell a scary mermaid story, and the other one is to show uh, good-looking girls in bikinis. Uh, and I'm not against good-looking girls in bikinis by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, it's uh, the weight is a little off. It's heavily weighted towards girls with bikinis and a little lighter on the mermaid action. The mermaid doesn't even get glimpsed until like 30 minutes in. And you don't really get mermaid action until about an hour in. But when you get to the mermaid action, sure is fun. I really enjoy what I'm seeing when the mermaid action happens. And it's, it, 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 to be fair, the mermaid action has you know some wonky CGI and stuff like that. But it, it, it still looks good enough and I'm having a good enough time that I really enjoy it. And it felt like a payoff to me. But the first part of the movie doesn't feel like that much of a slog because even though the dialogue isn't great and the acting isn't great, although I, I have an affinity for Christina Klebe, uh, who is the star of the movie, and she is American. And I think she's the only American in the movie. Uh, uh, the other girl playing an American is not American. You can just tell from the accent. But the, uh, uh, the, the Christina Klebe, she... Look, she's not a great actress, okay? Uh, I think she's probably most famous for being in Rob Zombie's Halloween, but uh, I just, I just like, I've always liked her when I see her. I find her to be compelling. Like in Proxy, she is great in Proxy, uh, but she's not great, but I like her. I, I'm just drawn to her. I don't know what it is. So her being in the movie really worked for me. Uh, these characters, you know, all speaking in English with their accents and, and just kind of this plot and everything like that, it's all just kind of silly and it kind of feels a little bit so bad it's good. It's a little slow, I'm not lying, uh, I'm not going to lie about that, but it it, it is uh, an interesting enough to me character development and, and, and plot setup that I wasn't bored. And they get to the island within 30 minutes, so there's a mystery that's starting to unfold. I was rolling with it. You know, Franco Nero shows up. Uh, that's fun. You know, legendary Franco Nero shows up. I, I There's enough here to keep me engaged that I think it just kind of hits me in the sweet spot, uh, and I enjoy it, but I realize not everybody's going to feel this way. Most people are going to find it to be cheap and find it to be a little bit of a slog. And I think the, 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 the mermaid action isn't going to be enough of a payoff for them. I don't feel that way. So that's why I chose it as an extra credit film. Uh, I, I I find it to be a good time. I find it to be a good time. I've seen it more than once. Uh, I, I, I just enjoy it. I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, for those few of you who have seen it, let me know in the comments below if you disagree. I have a feeling you will. Uh, I, I was debating whether or not to include this one, but... I enjoyed it enough. I was going to go ahead and put it in here. Uh, um, I do think that there is some flaws in the movie, and I, I find that to be a bit entertaining. You know, the idea that, you know, our lead character has a problem with water, so she decides to go on a vacation where she's going to be on a boat and, and go in the water is just... That's kind of funny to me. I don't know. I just... I had a good time with this one. Uh, I'm kind of recommending it, but with the caveat that you go in managing your expectations. So manage those expectations, check it out, and let me know what you think. And again, if you've seen it, let me know how I'm wrong. The next movie that we're going to talk about for extra credit is Dagon. Dagon came out in 2001 and is another Stuart Gordon movie. And I mentioned earlier when we were talking about Stuart Gordon that his, uh, his she creature probably wasn't even his most well-known or well-liked, uh, mermaid movie. And it's because of this one existing. And this is yet another HP Lovecraft adaptation, which is what he's known for. And, uh, I actually do like this one quite a bit, but not as much as I liked she creature. But we're going to get into that in just a second. First, if you haven't seen it before, the movie is an adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft, but not so much Dagon as it is Shadow Over Innsmouth. We have a group of friends who are involved in a boat accident off the coast of Spain and wind up going to this Spanish village, uh, like this fishing village, to try to get help, only to find that the inhabitants of the, the town, which is mostly deserted, are not what they seem to be and have some connection to a fish god of some sort, um, Dagon. They are worshiping Dagon, and there's all kinds of re weird religious cult hijinks that abound. And we'll stop there so as to not spoil the movie for anybody who hasn't seen it. But the movie feels like B movie schlock fun because it is B movie schlock fun. It's Gordon doing his Gordon thing, 
and and he really is nailing it. He's got the the kind of like the the sexiness like like working for it. He's got the creepy monsters working for it. And while it's got some wonky CGI in scenes, it's got a lot of practical effects that were working for me. Like the fish people look cool. They look really really good. And, and I like Shadow of Rain's mouth. It's maybe one of the uh, the the Lovecraft stories that I like uh, the most. It's I don't know if it's my favorite, but I have to think about that. But I do like it quite a bit. So. This adaptation and kind of blending it with Dagon is uh, the two short stories works for me, but Stuart Gordon doing doing Lovecraft generally always works for me. We've talked about it quite a bit. We talked about From Beyond. We talked about Reanimator. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, Castle Freak. Like a lot of Gordon stuff, his heavy Lovecraft uh, fascination tends to work for me. I like his work. I like She Creature a lot, and I like She Creature a little bit better, uh, just because I feel like it's a little bit more of a serious movie, uh, and I just thought it was a little more original. Uh, a little, I don't know, but I call it a gut reaction. I like She Creature, she, uh, she, she Creature better, but I did like Dagon quite a bit uh, because it's nailing what I call the Gordon aesthetic. I think all the stuff that I expect from a Stuart Gordon movie, it's delivering it in spades. Not a perfect movie. Like I said, they have some CGI issues. Eh. Uh, they have some weird stuff, like plot-wise. Like the group of friends are like people that are so disparate that you're just like, how are you friends? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Our, our lead guy is not your stereotypical lead guy, and apparently that is by design. Uh, like he's supposed to be kind of goofy and silly, uh, and, but it doesn't really work for me super well. But there's enough good stuff working that it doesn't matter that there's flaws. But they blew right past them because I'm enjoying the story. I'm enjoying the aesthetic. I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying the ride that Gordon is taking me on. Now, the movie does have like a silly kind of twist at the end that didn't super work for me. And that may be part again of why like I, I really like the ending of She Creature. I didn't like the ending of Dagon as much. It kind of, for me, was a little eh, hard sell for me on that twist. It felt like it was there to have a twist, but uh, you know, your mileage may vary on that one. I won't spoil what the twist is, of course, but but uh, overall, fun ride movie. I definitely would say it's worth the time to check out. I definitely would say that it scratches the Stuart Gordon itch. If you're a fan and you haven't seen this one, you should check it out because you're going to get what you want from this. And if you like mermaid movies, this is a good mermaid movie. Uh, you know, fish people, it, it's, uh, yeah. It's <laughs> it's something else, man. But uh, uh, definitely worth your time. And I'm sure a few of you have seen this one. So let us know what you think in the comments below. But uh, yeah, I like Dagon too. Um, not as good as She Creature, but still pretty damn good. And the last extra credit movie we're going to talk about today is Lady in the Water. Lady in the Water came out in 2006 and is directed by M. Night Shyamalan. And as you guys all know, I am an M. Night Shyamalan apologist, but I cannot apologize for this movie. Uh, look, this movie is not even technically really a mermaid movie, although, again, we all know what we're talking about here. And 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 by no means is this a good movie, and we're going to get into that very much so. But I had to put this in here because I had to talk about it. Uh, I've been wanting to talk about this for a while, so now's, now's the time. We're going to talk about it. If you haven't seen it, the movie is about a superintendent or a handyman in, a, in an apartment complex who finds a sea creature, a water nymph, in the pool at the, at the apartment complex who is trying to get home and is being attacked by this weird wolf-like creature and has a very crazy fairy tale type story that, that ties into uh, the, the saving of the world through an amazing writer. And, it, you know, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter what it's about because it's so incredibly ridiculous. Uh, I, like, I, I'm not going to spoil it, but it doesn't even matter because it doesn't matter. This stuff is nonsense. It's all nonsense. Um, and, and, that, and that's part of what we're talking about here because this movie is maligned. People hate this movie, and rightfully so. Like I said, I am a Shyamalan apologist. I love me some M. Night Shyamalan. And up until this movie came out, I loved all those movies. Even The Village, which is wildly divisive. I love The Village. We talked about it before on the channel. This movie came out, and I didn't see it right away in the, in the theaters. I, I didn't get a chance to. I didn't see it till home video. And I'd heard the really negative response. So that's, I think, why I avoided it. I was just kind of put off by that. And I really thought, well, everybody's overreacting because everybody hated The Village, and, and, and I actually loved it. So I put this movie in, and I watched it. And partway through, I thought to myself, is this a joke? Is Shyamalan playing a joke on the audience? Is this a prank? Is this like a prank of a movie? Because it literally feels like you're being pranked. This movie is an incredibly convoluted fairy tale that supposedly he would tell his daughters uh, as a bedtime story, but it's so convoluted. And 
And, and, and here's the thing. A convoluted movie is one thing. But this movie is literally actors telling you the plot for the entire movie. It is the most exposition I've ever seen in a movie. I, I didn't know you could get this much exposition into a movie. It is wild. You've got Paul Giamatti, you've got uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, you've got Jeffrey Wright, you've got M. Night Shyamalan in the movie as, uh, as a writer, more on that in a minute. Quality actors doing horrible work because the script is terrible. Because there's no other way, apparently, for Knight to, com to, to convey this story, this fairy tale, to the audience other than to have characters literally explain it to you. There's literally a character, uh, a Korean woman whose grandmother knows the story in Korean and she tells it to the, the granddaughter who then conveys it to Paul Giamatti and by extension the audience in piecemeal. As you need to know details of what's going on, she goes, oh, my grandmother told me more about the story. This means this and this eagle is going to eagle's gonna come and these things and it's just, it's all nonsense too, like, you know. Uh, like I said, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard plays a mermaid, but she's not a mermaid. She's not a water nymph. And she's not even a water nymph. She's something called a narf. It's a water. It's a water nymph. Whatever. And 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 there's this wolf-like thing called a scrunt. And all these names don't mean anything. It's it's all nonsense. It's all fairy tale nonsense. And then there's this whole mystery about the, all the characters in the movie, who are all the inhabitants of the apartment complex, are all part of this fairy tale story they all have a role to play but it's confusing as to who is which role and that's part of the mystery and you don't care you don't care and and then of course there's this whole thing and this is the thing that most people hate about the movie is that the whole thing is she's supposed to be there to inspire this writer to write the greatest story of all time that will save humanity and of course m night Shyamalan's playing that and that's what people focus on is like oh look at the pride of in the in the the hubris and the, and the arrogance of M. Night Shyamalan to put himself as the legendary, amazing writer. That is not even in the top 10 of things that are wrong with this movie, in my opinion. Like, people really fixated on that. It's a problem. Yeah, it's, it, it, everything is true. The complaints are true. But that ain't even the, the start of it. You know, the whole thing, there's a movie critic uh, in, the, in the movie, uh, and he, you know, he gets victimized, and, and we were talking about, oh, it's M. Night Shyamalan making commentary on his critic, which which I thought led to the practical joke thing that I was thinking when I watched this movie because I couldn't believe it. It was literally like people just telling us. It, they, they, it just, it, it blew my mind. It blew my mind how bad this movie is. Like I often say this is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It's not that I haven't seen like worse movies in terms of like filmmaking quality and that, but it's such an egregious use of exposition. It's like one of the cardinal sins for a movie and from a director who, and a writer who knows better, who knows this stuff, to do it so blatantly. And I couldn't help but think that uh, because this is, he had left, uh, you know, it was Disney, I think he was working with and went to Warner Brothers. I can't remember which studios it was, but he had left because he wanted to have this more, more autonomy. And maybe sometimes giving filmmakers more autonomy is not the way because he needed somebody to come in and tell him this was a bad idea and not let him do this. It's horrendously bad horrendously bad i mean i mean kind of almost laughably bad if it wasn't so tragic because this really sends his career riding off right off the rails like it takes him a long time to recover if he ever did i think he did but yeah I, it's mind-boggling how bad this movie is i i hate this movie i'm not recommending it to anybody other than to watch a train wreck because you hear me saying it's full of exposition and you're like oh yeah there's gonna be a lot of exposition no 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 it's all exposition all of it you've got every character just telling you what's going to happen or what is happening or what has happened because otherwise you don't know and it's and none of it moves you there's no emotional connection there's nothing here it's just so phenomenally bad phenomenally bad and i don't know how it even got made other than m night was at the height of his powers and could do anything and that's what he did and I remember when this movie was coming out. I remember the trailers for it. And it had like kind of this cool and you know whimsical, but also kind of slightly mysterious uh, trailer of different scenes. And then the tagline at the end was like a fairy tale brought to you by M. Night Shyamalan. And you're like, ooh, it's going to be creepy and scary. And it's going to be cool because it's M. Night Shyamalan. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, really not, man. I, that, the apologist in me cannot in good conscience recommend this to anybody. But if you wanted to just see the train wreck in slow motion 
check it out. Let me know what your thoughts are. I know a lot of you have seen Lady in the Water. And is there anybody out there that actually thinks it's a genuinely good movie that can actually defend it? Because when even I can't defend it, that's saying something. So let me know in the comments below if you can defend it. But I'm guessing most of you share my share my dismay at this movie. So we can keep talking about that in the comments below. So that's going to do it for mermaid horror. Uh, this is a, a fun little subgenre to me. It says a very niche and it just works for me. I don't know, uh, uh, you know, if it's the water setting, uh, if it's the cool makeup effects, if it's the creepy idea of taking something like Little Mermaid and turning it on its, on its head and just really delving into like the gruesome aspect of mermaids as opposed to the whimsical aspect of them. But whatever reason, these movies tend to work for me, Lady in the Water notwithstanding, of course. Uh, so uh, yeah, I had a good time with these. I'm hoping you guys have a good time with them too. If you haven't checked them out, check them out uh, and let me know what you think. But now I think it's time to look at a horror trivia pursuit card because it's that time where I read a question live on camera and then try to answer it. And we're going to go with the monster category because mermaids and creatures, monsters, sure, whatnot. Um, so here's our question for this week. In 1985's Fright Night, what kind of supernatural creature is Jerry Dandridge? Okay, I, I, obviously I know this. And most of you should know this too. Almost everybody listening should know this. Um, but that's not what's not annoying me. What's annoying me about this question is that we just got one of these like a couple weeks ago. It was a different movie, but it was the same thing. Like what type of supernatural creature is this person? By the way, you know, if, if you've been paying attention uh, to the videos, uh, same kind of creature. So this is kind of weird to get the same kind of question. And it is a very easy question, in my opinion. I feel like even if you haven't seen the movie, if you know anything about the movie, you know the answer to the question. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, so Fright Night, we've talked about Fright Night. We've talked about Fright Night's remake. Love me some Fright Night. Uh, uh, it's it's one of the best of its subgenre. Really, really great. I'm trying not to. I'm trying to prattle without giving away the answer, even though, again, like, it's such an easy answer. So I'm not going to prattle too long because you all know it. Uh, but yeah, let, suffice to say, Fright Night, uh, a wonderful representation of this kind of creature. Uh, one of the best in its class. Uh, and I love it. And, and so... Let's go ahead and just wrap this up because it's not a hard question and I don't think I need to give you a lot to think about it. Either you know it or, or you really, if you don't know this, then you need to watch Fright Night like immediately, uh, both the original and the remake. They're both very good. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and give my answer, lock your answer in. My answer, of course, is vampire. Jerry Dandridge is a vampire. Let's check the card just to confirm. A vampire, a vampire. Uh, so yeah, that not not the hardest question in the world. And like I think a couple weeks ago, we had the one about uh, uh, let the right one in. What kind of uh, creature was the character in that? That's also a vampire movie. So it was just weird to have the same kind of question in such short succession. Like, at least for me, it might have been a few weeks now for you guys since that question came up. But for me, it came up very recently because I filmed these in, in bunches. So uh, that that question, all right, I got it right. I don't feel like amazing, but you guys probably got it right too. If you didn't get it right, what did you guess? Uh, but yeah, I'm guessing most of you got it right too. Anyways, let's go ahead and wrap this up for this week. I hope you guys had fun with it. I certainly had fun with it, so hoping you guys did too. Next week we'll be talking about something completely different, but until then... This whole thing hits so much differently after watching the lure.